Amen. You may be seated as we hear a reading from the Gospel of John. The reading is from John chapter 6, verses 24 through 35, and you can find it on page 867 in your pew Bible. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So the book of Mark starts with the line, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Good news there could also be translated gospel. It could some translations actually say the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news. Gospel then becomes the word people use to describe the whole genre of books that include Mark, of course, and later Matthew and Luke and John. As much as the travel book genre is about traveling, yeah, and the romance novel genre is about romance, you would think the gospel genre, the good news genre, would be about good news, right? And yet lots of people have a really hard time believing that God would simply give good news. That people are invited to simply receive. Imagine I sat you down and gave you a stack of papers a list of every single thing you will ever do for the rest of your life. A list of your doings just goes on and on from one sheet to the next. Things you are obligated to do, things you're supposed to do, some things you like to do, many things you have to do. Imagine if you could be sent out of here today with your stack of to-dos. Might need a box, right? But let's say that's not the only stack of papers that I'm going to send you home with. What if I also provided you a list of all the things that will ever be done for you? Acts of kindness. Gifts you'll be given. Mercies shared. Acts of forgiveness offered you. What if this second stack was a giant list of, well, instead of to-dos, a giant list of to-receives? Which stack would you call gospel? 
Like, which list is good news to you? The to-do list or the to-receive list? In the story just before our text for today, Jesus fed 5,000 and many more from five loaves and two fish. Jesus feeds with such abundance that there are 12 baskets of leftovers. All are fed. No one at this feeding of the 5,000 and many more had to confess a certain creed. None of them had to justify their lifestyle. None of them had to prove their worthiness to be fed. The whole point of this sign was very simple, that God feeds, that people are fed. God does the feeding. People, all the people, are fed. Notice, God does the work. The people, all the people, receive God's work. It's a foundational elementary, essential lesson, and a lesson that's really hard to take in. Like, still. For people then, for people now. God feeds the people, all people, are fed. God does the work. We receive God's work. I know it sounds super simple, but it's hard for a lot of us to get that. John, the gospel writer, tells us that this feeding episode ends with the people turning to each other and saying, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Yes, but what does that mean? Well, much like an observer of art can completely misunderstand what they're looking at, what it means, we see that the people who were fed did not understand from the feeding who Jesus was or what Jesus meant to them or to the world. And this is still a problem for lots of Christians today, so it's a good text to dig into. John ends the feeding of the 5,000 and many more by telling us that when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Picture that. All these people are like, ooh, a prophet who teaches amazingly, miracle worker sent by God. We were hungry, and now we're not. Make him the king. Make him our king. That way Israel can dominate the region again. You know, people are thinking politically. People are thinking militarily. They're thinking financially. A great king? could make everything in this world better for us. And in response to that kind of religious nationalism, because that's what it was, in response to this desire to make Jesus their king, Jesus, John tells us, withdraws to the mountain by himself. Like, nah. The next day, the crowd sees that neither Jesus nor his disciples are there. They're like, oh, where'd he go? So they get into their boats, the crowds do, and they go to Capernaum hunting for Jesus. The Greek word is not just searching for they're hunting for him. And when they finally find him, they say, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus said, you aren't looking for me because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Give you. You aren't looking for me because you saw signs. Remember, the Gospel of John is a series of signs that each point to who Jesus truly is, what God is truly about, and what there is to really believe in, what there is to hope for, what there is to live for. So you might remember, Jesus turns water to wine as a sign to show that God is joy. Jesus heals a royal official's son as a sign that God is God to all, not just some. Raising Lazarus from the dead is a sign that death is powerless in the presence of Jesus. So John tells this series of stories that are meant to be signs. Good news, each one that points 
to how great God is. But you, Jesus says to the people that were hunting for him to try to make him their king, he says, you aren't looking for me because you saw anything. You just like the bread. (laughs) You want more bread. Bread being a metaphor here for more power, more pleasure, more privilege, more goodies, the kind of stuff that feeds a hunger. And you think I, Jesus, am your ticket to all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that perishes. Power, pleasure, privilege, they all pass away. This is why Jesus says to them, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Give you. So these people had already been confused about what they were hoping Jesus would give them. They were really focused on the bread. They were focused on the worldly stuff. While Jesus was talking about life beyond life, Well, with their next question, they show they're just as confused, not just about what Jesus gives, but how Jesus gives. They're like, okay, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. Okay. So they ask, what must we do to perform the works of God? What must we do? That's their question. They want that first stack of papers I asked you to imagine a minute ago, the really long to-do list of everything you'll ever have to do for the rest of your life. Because a lot of us come to a room like this and we are trying to be a good spouse or a helpful friend or a loving child or a parent who equips their children or a productive employee or a strong citizen We want to be a careful creature of the earth, and so we wonder, what must we do to perform the works of God? Give it to me, Jesus. I got boxes to carry it out. I've even got a minivan. But as much as Jesus was not there to become their king, Jesus was also not interested in burdening them with some endless list of to-do items. Instead, he starts to describe a different kind of list, a good news list, a gospel list, a list of gifts from God. Instead of a to-do list, Jesus offers a to-receive list. What must we do to perform the works of God, they ask. Jesus says, well, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom God has sent. You believing is you receiving the work of God, receiving the truth that Jesus teaches, receiving the healings, the wholeness, the community that Jesus always offers. In short, believing is receiving life, eternal, abundant life that is beyond life. They set out in those boats hunting for Jesus because they wanted temporary, small little bits of power. But Jesus offers eternal, abundant life beyond life that is so much more than any temporary, boundaried, worldly power. Jesus says, believe in him whom the Father has sent. Okay. Well, how are we supposed to do that? That's their next question. And I think it's a pretty good question. Have you ever asked that question? Like, God, how are we supposed to believe in Jesus when the world's lies are very compelling? When my fear is quite real, when my worries are, pretty strong. And Jesus feels a lot more like a bedtime story. Like, for me to stand up here and say, just receive the good news of God. Well, that sounds nice and easy. Like, why wouldn't you? Because cancer? War? Hunger? Bad things happening to good people? Good things happening to what seem like bad people? Because there's a lot of other stories that are easier to believe. Because some of those stories 
promise things, maybe I want more. <laughs> Health, wealth, happiness. Instead of love thy neighbor, love thy neighbor. That sounds harder. Jesus is promising life, capital L, beyond the struggle bus we call life. But even if I wanted to believe in him whom the Father has sent, how are we supposed to do that? So they asked Jesus, what sign are you going to give us so that we may see and believe? And then they try to help Jesus out with a suggestion. Like, well, here's one, Jesus. Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I mean, basically, they're saying, you want us to receive you, Jesus. You want us to believe you by receiving you. Well, then, could you do that trick we already know? The one Moses did? Like, give us a sign we already kind of understand. We like the manna one a lot. That was great. Do that one. And then maybe we can believe you. Then maybe we can receive you. And this is where Jesus does the work of God. Here Jesus creates again. With words, he creates a new understanding of what was and a new hope for what can be. Jesus says, you know, it wasn't Moses who was the giver of that bread from heaven. It was God the Father. And the giving of God is not to only be remembered and celebrated as something given and done in the past. We give thanks for God's presence in the present. And here's the real humdinger. Jesus says, the true bread of heaven wasn't the manna. Like, that just filled bellies. The bread of God come from heaven is me. I am the bread of life. You like that manna story? What if I told you God's doing something in me that does so much more than simply making people's bellies full? In John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus about a birth beyond birth. In chapter 4, he told the woman at the well about water beyond water. Well, here in chapter 6, he's talking about himself being bread beyond bread because God sees our wilderness God hears our cries as much as God saw and heard the people in Exodus God knows our fears our frustrations God is aware of our temptations and our pain it is in response to cancer and war and hunger and all the other stuff that limits this life it is in response to all that that God sends Jesus, who does the work we cannot do. God feeds. People are fed. God does the feeding. All people are fed. And what's really incredible is what happens after people move off from the to-do list and start to truly receive gratitude happens peace happens a bunch of stuff that's really quite great for the receivers the believers but what's far more incredible than what happens for the receivers of God's works is what happens to the people and systems around the receivers because gratitude and peace, when a person starts to taste the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they cannot help but start to be kind to others. They can't help but be generous to others. They can't help but be hopeful instead of cynical. They can't help but be life in a world that's trying to convince everyone that death is the final word. I know you know this, as I look around this room, as I saw people coming in for worship this morning, it's like an all-star group of hopers, of receivers, people that know what I mean about what it changes us when we're full of gratitude and peace. We can't help but go be God's work in the world. At baptism, each of us is given a, a to-receive list that each of us would be added to all of us 
forming a community of receivers, of believers, who become the work of God ourselves wherever we go. And we go a lot of places. Because whoever comes to Jesus will never be hungry. Whoever believes in Jesus will never be thirsty. We will be fed for our own sake and for the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing.